Welcome to the Stop Listing Podcast. This is the Seller Spotlight. I'm Isaiah Nuker and I'm interviewing Cody Hawk. And today we're going to be talking about Amazon FBA, eBay, reselling, Project 12K, and more. So stay tuned. So we have with us Cody Hawk today. And the first question I want to ask Cody is how did you get started on your selling journey? I got started back in. 2009, 2010, I really got interested in auctions. That's what got me excited about reselling. And so my, my first early sourcing days were actually in auctions, a little bit of stored goods, and primarily auction houses. Okay, well, actually, I started watching, uh, you know, some different uh, YouTube channels. One of the main ones was Lyndon Cameron. And I really got interested in storage shed auctions. I, I started doing that. I still do it to this day, but not a lot. And then I, I found a couple local auction houses in my area and that had just amazing inventory. So I really got hooked on the auction thing. And then, you know, I needed a, I'm not a collector of any kind, so I needed a way to, you know, move the merchandise. And so what I did is I got started on eBay and found eBay as a great outlet to, uh, you know, buy and resell, and within a year's time, I started making really good money and thought to myself, you know, I could probably turn this into a business as opposed to, you know, the, the corporate job that I had at the time. Right. And so a lot of sellers are sort of on the fence with, you know, eBay, selling online. What kind of advice do you give to them? The, the biggest thing is commitment. Once you, you know, it's easy to, to take reselling as a hobby, and it's a great little hobby to have that can make you some money. But if you're thinking about jumping into reselling, and especially if you're thinking about going full time, uh, you know, you got to be really committed and dedicated to doing this on a daily basis. And I recommend, you know, mapping out a plan of what you want to do, what your goals are as far as financially, and give it six months. And basically what I did is I went full time while I was full time. So what I mean by that is I worked a corporate job where I had over 100 employees and I, I basically was working 50, 60 hours a week at the time. And I decided I'm going to do my business. But instead of just leaving my job, I basically took on a full-time business while I was working a full-time job. And the only realistic way to do that is time management. So really buckle down on your time management skills. That's the number one thing that allows me to run three businesses to this day. Right. I, I see you in videos, and I notice that you, uh, you know, you're planning around your life pretty. You're you're planning your time wisely, like um, you know shopping at night and things like that. Could you explain more about time planning and having time for your family while doing reselling at the same time? Yeah, that, that's key. And so what I've done is I've maximized my time by zeroing in on the categories and on the types of products I'm going to sell. A lot of false information is being thrown out there. Things are being said like scan everything or go to all these different stores what I've done is I've zeroed in on niche products that work for me and my business and that way I'm able to go out and source for certain products because it's not you know possible I do this full-time and I couldn't imagine going to you know several dozen stores or thrift stores or auctions daily and trying to look at everything so one key is actually planning out what niches will work for you and then when it comes the listing, photographs, all these different steps in your business, block out times that will actually work to get those done and stay on task. There's so many distractions in this world, you know, with all this video and all, you know, phones being tethered to media at all times. So really block out times. How I work is I work in two hour bursts. So throughout my day, I'll set up two hour bursts where I'll get stuff done. And then, you know, then I'll spend time with family and do the other things I want to do. Sounds good. So, um, yeah, time, time is one of the most important issues for resellers. Um, oh, yeah. I myself, you know, struggle with having time management and just making time for all the things that I want to do. You know, you have to list and ship and, you know, source items. But at the same time, you have to, you know, be the family member, you know, the person you're supposed to be for everyone in your family. And so Absolutely. I hear you talking a lot on uh, your videos, which are great, by the way. I hear you talking about, you know, the daily grind of feeding the beast or, you know, feeding the machine on Amazon FBA. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah I mean, Amazon FBA, there's so much potential with, with FBA. 
but I mean, it needs to be fed regularly, especially right now going into fourth quarter, right. uh, you know, setting up your shipments. And what, what a lot of people run into is actually being able to fill their boxes. When you ship something on Amazon FBA, typically they'll break your shipment up into several different warehouses. So what I do is I set goals to send out 10 boxes a week, which is what's working for me right now. I'm sending out 10 boxes a week uh, based on the sourcing that I'm doing. But the key is consistency. Again, it all comes back to consistency. So even if you're sending one or two boxes, you just want to make sure you're regularly sending inventory in Amazon and regularly listing on eBay. Right. And so when you're shipping out boxes to, to, to the UPS store, when you have your FBA shipments ready and packaged, sometimes you might come up with uh, large shipments such as, you know, over 50 pounds and things like that. How do you yep. manage the large shipping packages? Well. If they're if they're slightly over, I will. Uh, you, you know, you could write team lift on it if it's above 50 pounds, and right. I've done that a few times. Boxes are slightly over. If they're drastically over, I'll just break it up into two shipments. Right, but my question is more about how do you manage, um, you know, getting them into the UPS store. For instance, um, you might have several shipments, like you say, you try to get 10 per week. Um, yep. If they're all 50 pounds, how are you? What's the best way to get it inside the store without, you know, hurting yourself or, you know? Um, oh, I see what your question is. Well, for me, I, you know, I, I lift weights a lot. I'm a fairly big guy, and so um, I just pick them up and take them in. But if you're smaller, one thing I actually have somebody I've worked with on this, and they got those foldable dollies. I would just carry a dolly around with you and throw it on a dolly, bring it right in the UPS store. UPS super friendly. They'll also help you out. Hmm, that's good advice. Okay, so in your videos, we couldn't help but notice the Fender Stratocaster hanging in the background of all your videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, though it's not quite the same. Um, you mentioned some great success selling uh, Guitar Hero. So did, yep. you, did you have any challenges in shipping these guitars in particular? In the beginning I did because I was really worried about them breaking or them rattling, you know, too hard. So basically what I do, I wrap them in bubble wrap, I usually go around them twice, and then I will make just a custom box, I make a custom box for each one, but uh, a lot of money in Guitar Heroes, that's that's a good little niche right there. Yeah, it's a pretty good niche, um, Gibson, you know, Fender Stratocaster, those are all still selling pretty good, even now. Yeah, they are, even though it's saturated, I'm still selling them. Right, so, like we discussed earlier, you talk about um, how do you get your packaging? In your videos, you talked more about um, going late at night to find bids where you could bid on tape and boxes and things like that. But yep. could you talk about more tips for people who might not be able to do that? Yeah, if you're not a night owl like me, which I know a lot of people with jobs aren't, uh, one thing I would do, I would still go on eBay. There's so much packaging available on eBay. For boxes, a lot of stores will give away boxes, and everyone knows that, but one thing to keep in mind is let the stores know that not only are you interested in the boxes, like for me locally, there's a place called Payless Shoes, mm -hmm. and I let them know, look, I, you know, I basically let them know I'm a reseller, I sell on eBay and Amazon, and so I worked out a deal with them, and they basically put a whole bunch of packing material in a box for me, all this bubble wrap, this brown paper, and, and to these big corporations, it's garbage, but to resellers, it's gold. So, right. you know, don't be afraid to ask because that's that's the number one tip. If you ask, you'd be surprised what you can get for free sometimes. And that's one of the things that makes, you know, Craigslist work the way it does because a lot of people don't see, you know, free boxes on Craigslist or something like that. Yeah. And so um, my next question is, you talked about the frozen items from Disney and you talked yep. about how you ship them out. And I've also seen the frozen the frozen, you know, craze, quote unquote, sweep through the selling community. So how has it been as far as, um, you know, costume items, things that are trendy? How have those sales been in FBA? They've been really good. I didn't just stick to frozen. Uh, a lot of costumes have done good. So even the Rapunzel, you know, I talk a lot in my videos about princess dresses and things of that sort because little kids, I mean, I've got two little girls myself and they're always playing dress up. And so I, that, that's what really inspired me to get into those niches. And Frozen was, you know, one of the biggest things that has hit FBA in a long time. But all those costumes seem to do really well. Everything from Rapunzel to Snow White to, to Belle, any little uh, princess. And especially right now going into Halloween, going into winter, the, the sales on those do really well. Right. Um, you know, during Halloween, um, I noticed that a lot of people are 
preparing themselves for FBA, sending off items in bulk. So do you get, you know, you also talk about sort of getting into grocery on FBA. And I noticed that a lot of people are also sending off their, you know, holiday grocery items like, you know, candy corn, you know, chocolate, etc. Well, not multiples, but, um, you know, other items. So could you explain more about how people can get into the grocery side of FBA? How I got into the grocery side of FBA was thinking outside the box. And so what I originally started was was uh, gluten-free items because that's something that was kind of a, a trend. I talk a lot about trends and seeing what other people are interested in and basically uh, taking the need that they have and solving their problem with a product on FBA. So uh, gluten-free was really good. And then I've done really good with like cake mixes. You got to make sure it's something, of course, that's non-perishable has a, a longer shelf life is very important because you don't want to lose the money. Right. Um, but I, I would recommend starting on, you know, trends like that or things, things that, uh, you know, people need. But my biggest tip for grocery items is bundles. I've basically done most of my sales in grocery by bundling items together. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, usually, like, you'll see, you know, different kinds of bundles for, like, you know, like, for instance, back to school. That's something really popular. Um, and just holiday themed bundles as well. So my next question is, you were talking about how you got into eBay for the past couple of years, but what made you really take the plunge into FBA? Uh, well, I've gotten a lot more over the last three years into passive income in general. And even though FBA is really not that passive, it's more passive than eBay. And I saw it as a way to split my business. So all the stuff I'm sourcing basically goes into two piles, FBA or Amazon, mm. or excuse me, eBay or Amazon. eBay, I warehouse and, and do the whole deal. FBA, I'm able to, to sub that out. And while I've gotten more into a passive income and virtual assistance, it just seemed like a great opportunity to be part of this trend. And being that they're one of the largest retailers and largest websites in the world, I mean, now is definitely the time to jump on the bandwagon. I agree. So, um, yeah, definitely. It seems just to be growing larger and larger. Yeah. But, you know, with that, there's a lot of people who are sort of missing out on information. They, they're on the fence. They don't really know what to do. Some of them have already signed up. And so one of the questions that a lot of people are having is the ranking system. It seems that, you know, some people say stick close to the rankings, get them as low as you can, while others say, you know, create your own products. You know, don't concern about the rankings. What's your take on that? My take, I mean, obviously product creation is something I've got into a lot recently, and I think that's definitely the future of FBA. That being the case, FBA is not going anywhere as far as people, you know, sourcing the way they have been and putting products. I, I don't worry about the ranking system the way that a lot of people do. I sell a lot of books. I've got over 2,500 books at FBA right now and a lot of long tail items. For me, Building up my inventory is a lot more important than the ranking system. I think people take that way too far. I think it's a good guideline for retail arbitrage, but you know, when you're thrifting and you're sourcing inventories in those ways, if you can get a good product with a good ROI, it really doesn't matter if it sits for eight months. Mm. And could you ex could you expound on um, long tail items versus short tail? Yeah, what it is, like, so a short tail item, I buy a lot of stuff, I do a lot of retail arbitrage, people who watch my videos see that, and a lot of times I'll find stuff that's a really hot item, the frozen items being a good example, I would sell those items and they would be gone within, the frozen items would usually be gone within a day or two, mm -hmm. other items are gone within a week or two. Long tail items, typically, I'll buy books with three, four, five million sales rank, and what that means is it hasn't sold in quite some time. Now, Amazon hasn't... You know, they're not, they don't tell you in days, they give you the sales rank. And so, but you can check, you know, sources like camelcamelcamel.com is a great source to see how it's selling. Right. But a long tail item just means that it might be in your inventory a little bit longer. But ultimately, I mean, building up your inventory with quality products is a lot more important. Yes, it's true. So here's another question I have for you. So when you have a family, you know, and you're doing, you're doing FBA, you're doing eBay, you're sourcing all the time. Have you ever sourced for FBA while you're on the road or on a vacation with your family? Absolutely. I'm actually doing that next week, and I'm going to Seattle. But we've gone to L.A., Seattle, Portland, whenever we're going somewhere. This is the great thing about what I do and the way my lifestyle, because I, people always ask me, what you know, when do I work? And I always say that I always work and I never work because I love my life. I love my job. And the cool thing about it is we've turned it into a family business, and I've kind of 
did some of that in my videos where we go sourcing together and we, it's something fun for us. So we, we go sourcing all the time. To us, it's just fun to go out and see what's available. Right, and on the, and on the topic of sourcing together, so how, how has having so many different items changed your perspective on owning things? Oh, dr drastically. It's, it's unbelievable. And that's one, I guess I'm lucky because I, I talk to a lot of resellers and a lot of them are collectors. Right. I, other than books, like I love books, and I, you know, but other than books and a couple other things, I don't really collect much. And I, for some reason, since I've, you know, I, I, not to go too deep, but I grew up a little bit different, didn't have anything growing up really. Mm -hmm. And so when I got older, started making a lot of money, owned a couple businesses, worked at a couple really good jobs. I just bought stuff left and right because I just thought that's what I would do. That's what people do. Now that I'm a reseller and I own thousands of products, even though I don't see them as mine because they're all for sale, right. I'm really becoming more and more of a minimalist as the years go by. Oh, that's pretty, that's a pretty interesting parallel there. Yeah, it's, it's a lot different than when I was, you know, making the same money or, you know, maybe not even as much, but spending tons of money on, on useless items that I thought I needed just because I could afford. Right. So on that subject, um, during times like Christmas or birthdays, how do you, how do you hide items for your family? You know, because you always go sourcing together and things like that. How do you find time to find these items that are something that will be appreciated? Well, we usually will go out, you know, a lot of my kids' birthday presents and Christmas presents. The, the funny thing about the kids, they're so used to us buying stuff that we can actually buy their presents in front of them and they won't know it because they're used to their parents <laughs> yeah. spending tremendous amounts of money every week buying products. They don't even know it anymore. And it's actually, it's really humbled my kids too because they used to be kind of, uh, the, you know, the kids who always need something, want something, right. and they're so used to buying stuff that it's not the same. And same thing for us. I mean, we've bought presents right in front of each other and not even known it. Mm, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So on your on your video ch on your video channel on YouTube, Cody Hawk, you explain to um, resellers and viewers alike how they can start in the reselling niche and you know start with as little money as let's say twenty dollars. Yep. Do you have any start off niches that you would suggest for people for eBay or Amazon? Yeah, for eBay, I would recommend if you're just getting started, small electronics really really good I've done really well on that and also I did a recent video about clothing even though I'm not a huge clothing seller it's it's pretty shocking what you can buy some of these clothing brands for and resell them for and so those are a couple of good niches for eBay for Amazon toys I, I, I toys and books are probably my number one and number two selling items is toys and books media products do really well as well but toys and books do so amazing on Amazon I mean I could make a full-time income just off those two and on the subject of Amazon um, I noticed that you were showing people how to wrap and package items for FBA and I'm, I heard you mention that Amazon doesn't take the responsibility of your items and shipment and so could you explain more about that for sellers who are just starting an FBA and what precautions they should take? Yeah, Amazon, I mean, it's up to you as the seller. you got to think of yourself as a business owner, and that's the first thing you need to do when you start as a reseller. Even if you don't file an LLC, you need to think of yourself as a business owner, and it's your responsibility. So if you're sending in anything, glassware, mugs, anything that could potentially break, you need to take the precautions, whether it be bubble wrap, whether it be, you know, if something's open, like you're sending something plush, you need to bag it, like in a poly bag. So you really need to treat your items like, like you're shipping them to maybe an eBay customer, similar, you know, thought process, because if they do get damaged, in my most recent video I put up yesterday, I kind of showed that where I got some products returned to me from Amazon that were severely damaged, and from time to time it will happen. You could take a loss, but it's up to you to take those precautions where you're, you know, keeping your losses to a minimum. Hmm. Mm, that's a good point. And so, one of the, another one of the questions that I have was, um, could you talk more about Project Reseller? I noticed that you mentioned it in your YouTube videos, but could you, for the sake of our audience, could you just explain a little bit more about that? About my website? Yes, projectreseller.com. Yeah, what I'm doing there is I'm basically right now it's just a shell of what it will be over the next couple months. But what I'm doing is I'm creating a bunch of advanced videos, and kind of the big picture is I'm creating I'm working on creating a bunch of 
advanced videos they're going to talk about everything from information product creation to physical product creation to marketing strategies and a lot of the more in-depth topics and things how i've actually been able to create the success that i've created and another facet of project resellers i'm actually bringing some corporate sponsors on board and there's it's a lot deeper than me just getting some money i'm actually trying to hook up with some people to help out new sellers so not only is this site going to help out advanced sellers through the information that i'm uh, giving it's going to help out new and advanced sellers but i'm also trying to set some more things up to give back to a lot of these resellers because it, it can be expensive and overwhelming for some of them to get started so i'm actually working on some giveaways there as well but it's going to be a very uh you know video in-depth course basically to for me to be able to put these videos together and train people on reselling and it's going to be free and that's another reason why i'm you know working with some companies it's not going to be a paid membership site i know a lot of people do that but it's actually going to be a little bit deeper than what you'll see on these or virtually all these youtube videos well i can't wait to see that um one question that i have for you is um i noticed that you started project 12k yeah and this is one of the projects that i really enjoy that i've never seen before something fresh and unique that's really going to help people. But can you explain more about Project 12K and why people should be paying attention to it? Yeah, the the great thing about Project 12K, I get you know probably five six hundred emails a week between business and people off YouTube and Twitter and different things. People trying to communicate with me. And the great thing about Project 12K is I really took what a lot of people have came to me. They want to get started making money. They want to get started reselling and. In my personal opinion, I recommend getting started on eBay and then moving in to FBA, which is exactly what I'm going to show on Project 12K. And this is going to be a basic course. So why Project Reseller is going to be more advanced and it's going to have a lot of really cool stuff. This is going to be a bare bones basic course, but it's going to show people how I'm going to turn $50 into $12,000. And people are going to be able to follow along and follow exactly what I do. I mean, I made the, the eBay account public. It's Project 12K on eBay and they're gonna actually be able to follow along and see me pick the items I've actually got a video coming out later today about you know the items I picked we're gonna be listing them so they're gonna be able to follow along with somebody who's been able to make a tremendous in um, reselling and it's gonna show them exactly how they need to do it and that's you know my a lot of my videos are a lot different than what you'll see on YouTube and because I wanted my whole purpose behind my channel is to add value to the community and so that's where project 12k stems from right Giving back to the community is one of the things that um, a lot of eBay sellers and Amazon sellers don't seem to grasp. They seem to be more about you know taking or getting from the viewers when it's more about giving and educating one another in our community. And so, Absolutely. Right. And so on that note, um, one of the questions that I've had for you is, you talk about how you're... You talk about how when you're buying stuff from thrift stores such as books, you like to take time to read the book and, you know, if you, if you like it, and then ship it off to FBA. Has there been any interesting books that you've read or come across? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I, I find random books that are interesting. I primarily will read business-related books a lot of the time, and so books that maybe I've never, you know, known that were going to be available or something I've never seen but as far as interesting, uh, nothing, nothing mind blowing I've seen. I only read a few because I'm not the the fastest reader. But I really, you know, I've got, I'm kind of that twofold. I'm not a very fast reader, but I remember everything. So, but nothing, nothing I would overly recommend. My number one book recommendation is always the same. It's always the Four Hour Work Week. In my mm -hmm. opinion, that's the number one business book ever written. I understand. It's a good book. It's a good read. Yeah. So, do you see yourself doing um, retail arbitrage, thrifting? For an extended period of time, or is it, or is reselling one step in a greater, you know, in a greater step for you in your life? No, I can see myself reselling long term. We're actually looking at buying a facility, like a building, and we're really going to be expanding our reselling business through eBay, and then also I'm looking at designing my own platform to resell on. So. Uh, we're really going to be expanding that. Amazon FBA, I think, eventually will be more product creation. I don't know that I'll be doing retail arbitrage long time, long term. It might just turn into a fourth quarter thing for me eventually. Right. But thrifting and auctions, I could see myself doing that long term because I love it. Yeah, it's, it's hard once you get the bug. Yeah, it is.
All right, so one, one of my questions is, what is your advice to people who, they, they have very little money, they have very little motivation, they want to get started, but they just don't have the information? Um, first, first advice, I mean, if they're looking to get started, which is exactly why I'm doing Project 12K, but my first advice to them would be do research. So whether it's a YouTube channel like mine, a different channel, do some research, come up with your own, because one problem is people will watch something or see something, decide that's the end all be all, and you don't know where that person's coming from. So I would spend at least a couple weeks doing research, and I know that's not always the answer people wanna hear, but it's so important, it'll cut out a lot of rookie mistakes that don't need to be made, especially if you don't have the money to be able to afford to make those mistakes. Then I would focus on some niche products. So in, instead of you know trying to buy everything you see, I would look at you know toys or games or electronics and start selling on eBay and and slowly you know build your business. A lot of people try to jump in too fast, and you can lose a lot of money if you do it that way. Right. And speaking of losing money, um, a lot of sellers, especially on eBay, when they're first starting out, they don't understand that um, you know you're selling to a person and customer service is expected. And so in that vein, I want to talk about feedback and getting positive feedback and developing a reputation for your store. Could you suggest uh, some tips for our viewers? Absolutely. Uh, a couple things. I mean, when you're brand new, and I'm going to be showing this here in the next couple of videos, when you're brand new, the, the biggest thing to get a couple feedback is buy a couple small things for your business off eBay mm -hmm. to get some positive feedback because they'll leave you positive feedback usually, especially the big sellers, and that'll start your feedback going. Then, the, But the number one tip as a seller is always make sure you answer your customers' emails almost immediately and ship out within the next day make it a priority so every time I get an order it is shipped out within 24 hours Monday through Friday you know business days and the reason I do that I'd say 70 to 80 percent of my feedback it starts off with whoa fast shipping amazing shipping and also look in the drop down box a lot of times people will pay parcel select and I'll upgrade them a lot of times the upgrade it, sometimes it might be less other times it might cost you 50 cents or 40 cents it's worth it to, to gain that customer's you know, you'll get a loyal customer, you'll get somebody who will potentially come back. Mm -hmm. So go above and beyond for your customers like you'd want them to do for you. Right, treating others the way you would want to be treated. Exactly. And so on eBay, um, we've noticed that they're making a lot more changes to the structure for sellers to the benefit of buyers, um, mainly, yeah. mainly in aspect to returns, the returns policy. And so the returns policy is sort of becoming more like Amazon FBA where there is little reason that has to be given and a return is sort of not forced but more easy more um more easily obtained and so what is your take on this is this good for sellers or bad for them it's not good for sellers it, it never is unfortunately ebay and amazon is the same they are both a buyer based company without good sellers there's nothing for their buyers to base but that or buyers to buy but they take the side of of their buyers every time unfortunately we're playing in their sandbox so if we decide we want to sell we have to adhere to the rules they put i personally am not a big fan of what ebay is doing right now but i've you know i've decided i'm going to sell products on ebay and the only thing to do about it is continue to play in their sandbox leave or create your own program and so i'm just going to continue to do what i have to do and uh you know there's not much you can do about it right and you mentioned you mentioned um you know creating your own program um sort in in ways to speak um creating your own sandbox and so do you have any um suggestions for the, for our viewers about that how can they sort of, how can they sort of be in resell making money but also sort of escape all the rules of Amazon FBA or eBay. Well, I recommend mastering a few platforms. So, you know, you got Amazon, you got eBay, you got Bonanza. That's one that's not talked about a lot, but you can make money on there. I do a little bit. Okay. Uh, there's, there's different platforms. There's Etsy. So I recommend really becoming a fairly experienced reseller. And if you do and you have the resources, I mean, it's going to cost me money to create my own, you know, uh, platform. But ultimately 
taking control. There's other ways you can take control. Like I've talked about, product creation is a very big way to start taking a little bit of control back as a reseller or create your own website and then market it through social media and double list your products. So list them on eBay, list them on Amazon, and potentially also list them on your own website. And once your website gains traction, you'll start to have a little more freedom. Sounds good. And so... In our, in our society, technology is sort of coming to the aid of um, users everywhere. And so where technology wasn't, wasn't having a main place, there's more uh, resurgence of that helping sellers. And so in our case here, there's a startup called SHIP. And what they do is that they allow sellers to take photos of items and, ship, and they will come to your home and ship it for you and only charge you the shipping cost plus a $5 flat rate fee. And so what do you think about services like that coming, coming across the states and you know, sort of revitalizing how we see selling online? I think services like that are great. I, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So on one hand, a service like that would be fantastic for items with a little bit of value to them. The problem we're running into right now, and I'm doing this myself, I'm really ramping up my numbers like a lot of other resellers are because with eBay's new rules, you have to be with under that 5%. So the only way to kind of make yourself immune is to sell volume. And the best way to sell volume is to sell items with a lesser value. So while SHIP is an amazing program, the problem is when people on eBay start selling more 15 20 ten dollar items it makes it harder to utilize those services but overall I think those services are great mm, that's a good point okay so last question here so on your selling journey you, which, which is still ongoing um, has there been any you know sort of not mentors but people online you know other resellers that have inspired you to start your journey and continue it uh, my biggest, you know, uh, people I've looked at as far as YouTube for reselling is, uh, like I said, Glenn and Cameron has an amazing channel, and I know that he's not really promoting eBay or Amazon right now, but he's done a lot in reselling in the past, and he does a lot of product creation and e-products like I do as well. And then as far as reselling, my favorite reseller would, would be uh, Dallas Moore. I think he provides some of the best information online and then as far as mentors i actually have a mentor here locally somebody i've known a long time who has uh, he's, he's been a mentor to me as far as business is concerned that's very interesting and so if there's one word if there's one word of advice that you would like to leave for sellers today what would it be take action hmm. the biggest thing in in this society is there's so much information and it's easy to go out there and watch 100 YouTube videos or get a whole bunch of you know information overload. But the biggest thing is to take action. Don't sweat the small details and start. Because once you get started, you have a chance to succeed. But if you never get started, you'll never get anywhere. That's a powerful word. Thank you. Thank you, Cody, today. Thank, thank you. This has been a StopListing.com podcast. Sell a spotlight, Cody Hawk. August 14, 2014. If you would like to see any more podcasts with Stop Listing, just go to stoplisting.com-podcast.